there was a lot of rumors, um, you know, being uh, circulated, especially by uh, George Spate and his group. You know, he would come up one day and say, "Oh, Inoki Kumbambola would be the next prime minister," and um, at that time he had already um, elected himself as a prime minister. And uh, next day he would come, "Oh, Kumbambola would be prime minister," so and so. But um, as journalists, we live on rumor, rumors, and uh, we had to. Um, Verify each rumor, uh, like we are told. You know, don't uh, report on something that you are not sure of. So we had to go out and verify the rumor through calling people up and uh, talking to um, the proper authorities. And um, if the rumor was correct, then we reported on that. If it wasn't, um, then we just left it. And um, yes, the local uh, media had uh, reported on a lot of things that were based on rumors and that were not verified. And um, this uh, sort of created a chaos, you know, uh, the general public being misinformed. The, the Samoan and the Tongan, Tongan students had to leave the country because of the coup. So we were left with about six or seven journalists working on one Solwara at the, and at the same time working on the Pacific journalism online. We just at the time that one Solwara was not going to affect any, any of the safety issues. So we went ahead with the publication and no problems arose, so I think we made a good judgment of uh, going ahead with the publication of One Solwara. We had a marathon 36 hour run, I mean, working on One Solwara before it was published, so it was, yeah, it was handling pressure, and we came out on top, and One Solwara was just great. We received a lot of good response from our readers. I think, for me personally, uh, I think it was unfair. I think it was, uh, though they may have their own reasons, but uh, for someone like myself who was, who was out there for maybe the first two weeks and uh, sweating it out, if you like, and you know, really going out to get the news, you know, even though we did not have a budget, most of the things we paid from our own pockets. Well, I think it was a very short-sighted decision. Um, and it's a great pity that uh, they didn't consult um, our program. I think it was a decision that was based on panic um, on May the 29th. Um, and to be fair, um, there, there were a number of um, things that were happening that day that did create a, a, you know, an atmosphere of panic at USB. All the previous night, uh, Fiji television had been trashed by uh, a mob of um, George Spates um, uh, supporters, um, supporters by gunmen and vehicles, uh, where they completely went through uh, TV television, uh, wrecked the place, and uh, put the station off um, off air for two nights until the news came back again. Um, so that happened the previous night, and there seemed to be a whole mood, anti-media mood, um, by supporters of uh, Spate um, through Suva. Um, a number of international journalists um, next day fled, uh, first of all, um, down the road to, to Rappels and then the Pacific Harbour and progressively on to Nandi. Um, and um, at, near the campus itself, there were raids on Patty's uh, shop and also on Costuless. I don't believe there was ever any evidence that um, the website itself was any kind of threat um, for the university. He made a judgment that uh, the, it would be better and prudent and wise that the website uh, be pulled off uh, while we were in the heat of all the difficulties. And uh, there was a lot of discussion within the university. The vice chancellor made a decision, and I myself, uh, speaking for him, am not able to discuss that too much. So if you don't mind, I would simply say what a decision made. Uh, in the context of trying to protect the university and the uh, you know, freedom of the university to operate uh, after the conflict. In, uh, in this situation in uh, Fiji, um, the, the students responded uh, superbly uh, right from the very day of the, the coup itself, um, how everybody just went into action and uh, um, they were down on scene down to town Suva when they the rioting and uh, looting was going on, uh, and every day over the next um, couple of months we had, uh, we had people who were so keen to be in Parliament, um, and uh, they took more risks, I think, than the, 
conventional journalists, because the uh, ordinary journalists, uh, local journalists, um, and the overseas journalists um, all had uh, cars and uh, such like, um, they can get down to Parliament and in a fairly secure way. Uh, we, of course, have nothing like uh, those sort of logistics. Um, so many of our reporters were doing it the hard way, going through the bush tracks uh, into Parliament. And this is one of the untold uh, stories. Um, you know, there was considerable risk. Uh, in fact, I didn't realize uh, at, right at the beginning just, just how risky that was, because I hadn't realized that that was sort of the um, means that some, some were actually going in to cover Parliament. Um, but I thought on the whole that um, our students performed very professionally. They really rose to the occasion. I think that for more fun of becoming a journalist, sometimes you have to take a risk. And um, I think the whole idea of this, the, I mean, the, what we did uh, during the coup for, uh, provided us with the training, uh, with the, I think, on-the-spot training that uh, every journalist would, uh, what shall I say, uh, be faced with when they go out there into the real world. Uh, from that experience, I could say that you know, the, the practical side of journalism is is really is really um, uh, a positive thing, and it needs to be encouraged more. I would say the coup was um, covering the coup was an experience of a lifetime. That was a really good experience for me, especially in the field of I mean, work as a student journalist. I think it gave me an opportunity to see something real, live happening. Though I know it was not a very good thing, which happened to most of the Fijians. This was a unique journalism opportunity and uh, I believe that we used that opportunity to the best of our abilities.